So I want to start by telling you a story, or really just the beginning of a story that's still happening. Um, a story that repeats itself over and over again. And this story begins with the image of Shiva meditating high on a mountaintop. And so Shiva is prone to these long, deep, solitary meditations in which he like, loses himself in the abyss of his consciousness. And when Shiva meditates for too long, he becomes contracted and self-enclosed. He succumbs to his own centripetal force. And when this happens, as it so frequently does, the, um, the universe goes out of balance because in that state Shiva's not able to play his cosmic role, which is to dissolve things in their proper time before they become stagnant and obstructive. So in this particular story, the universe has started to go out of balance and in, in the Indian mythological tradition that, that balance is often symbolized by a sort of continual conflict between the Asuras and the Devas, the gods and the demons, the beings of light and the beings of darkness. And so whenever this happens, you now usually the, when the beings of darkness start to prevail, then the, um, the, the devas, the gods, they go, and pe they go and petition Shiva or Vishnu or Brahma for help. Yeah? But in this particular circumstance, when Shiva is sort of lost in his samadhi um, and has been lost for a very long time, they, they go to Brahma and, and, and Vishnu and they, and, they, and they beg them for help and Brahma and Vishnu say, well, you know, we can't play Shiva's cosmic role and we wouldn't dare go interrupt him or disturb him. And so they, they go and they petition the only being that's more powerful than any of them, the only being that's capable of pulling Shiva out of his meditative stupor and drawing him back into creative involvement with the world. And so that's uh, Devi, the supreme goddess. Yeah. So Brahma and Vishnu go to Devi, and at the very sight of her, they, they start to feel sort of breathless and, and panicked, and they, they're speechless. Um, they're overwhelmed by her beauty, and they fall down, and they start kissing her lotus feet. And she touches their throats to restore their power of speech. And they ask her if she'll incarnate, if she'll take an embodied form and go and seduce Shiva out of his meditation and back into creative involvement with the world. And so she agrees, but she lays down one fantastic and totally improbable condition. She says that she wants gods and men to stop suppressing the feminine principle, stop suppressing the excessive, abundant, uncontrollable, and sublime nature of the creative impulse. And she says that if they fail to honor and to adore that principle and to recognize it, not only in abstraction, but as the breath of all living beings, then she will immediately withdraw from the world. She will abort and leave an empty husk in her place. So Brahma and Vishnu are desperate and you know, they just sort of unblinkingly agree like, yeah, sure, we'll take care of that, no problem. <laughs> she, 
she kind of rolls her eyes because she knows how these things go. Um, but the arrangements are quickly made, and um, she, we will uh, incarnate as Sati, which means she who is. And she's going to be born to one of Brahma's ten mind-born sons, whose name is Daksha. And um, Daksha is a meticulous Brahmin priest. Okay? He um, is, on that account, um, someone who, in this context, represents uh, the sort of embodiment of the kind of suppressive forces that the goddess is warning against. Okay? Because, because, let me explain, because Daksha is a, is a very sort of ambitious ritualist, um, and his, his rituals create or project a particular image of the sacred, a particular image of fullness, right? Uh, that his, his practice and his beliefs are, um, are anxious to protect, yeah? And those, his ethic operates on an exclusionary principle, right? Everything that is outside of this particular idea of fullness is therefore um, profane, yeah, and isn't isn't acknowledged as part of the whole. Okay? But the kind of fullness that Shakti represents is precisely a kind of fullness that doesn't exclude anything from its fold, right? That every being, every image every idea, every possibility is within the scope of her creation. Okay? And so, from the very beginning, the stage is set for tragedy. Yeah. Okay. So, Sati's born into the world, and from a very young age, she starts to have these sort of visions, hallucinations, dreams of this strange figure who has, you know, long matted locks and he's naked except for a small tattered loincloth and his sinewy body is smeared with ashes that make his skin sort of glisten white. He's got the river Ganga in his hair. He's got a necklace of skulls around his neck. It's usually smoking ganja. If you're the father of a teenage girl, he's your worst nightmare. <laughs> and she starts to draw pictures of this, of this figure, um, you know, with charcoal on the back of paper. And, and her father, Daksha, of course, finds these images deeply disturbing because he faintly recognizes who this figure is. And he finds this figure very threatening. Yeah? Even if he sometimes acknowledges this figure in his ritual activities, he pretends to keep him alive simply as a symbol, right? so that he can manage and control everything that that figure represents. But here, his daughter seems to be enamored with the image of this figure, and she's producing symbols of this figure that he hasn't shown to her, and that he's pretty sure she hasn't been exposed to yet in this world, so he finds it troubling. <laughs> and she keeps these images really close to herself. She's like obsessed with these. So she carries her drawings around her, and the other girls her age see these drawings in there. Like, they're disturbed, but her pulse is quickened by these images, and she keeps them under her pillow sometimes. And, and one night, she, she sees him in a dream. She sees him in these curious places in cremation grounds, and sort of hiding on the margins of various scenes in the shadows and so forth. 
And he comes forward to her and these two syllables come to her lips and she utters Shiva in her sleep and it wakes her up. So when Sati turns about 16 and she starts to come into the age of desire, she starts to spend more and more time out in the woods alone. She will just send her attendants away and she'll go into the forest and she'll chant the name of Shiva. She'll stay there all day sort of swaying and maybe build a little fire and dancing, visualizing Shiva and sometimes she, she can even feel the breath of Shiva on the nape of her neck. She feels so close to him. So after a time, she decides that she wants to take this penance very seriously. And her father's starting to sort of catch wind of what she's doing. And he's pretty distraught. He forbids her to chant Shiva's name, but she does it anyways. So against her father's will, she retreats into the forest for a while. She starts to spend full nights there. She stays there for some weeks. They don't know where she is. She chants his name. She burns incense to him. She makes offerings of tea and sweets to Shiva. For several weeks, she becomes totally consumed in the vibration of this, of those two syllables that she chants continuously. Then at the end of this penance, she goes walking through the forest, wondering how she's going to unite with this figure of her dream. She knows now that it's her fate. She knows that it's, in some sense, her destiny to unite with him. She walks into a clearing in the forest, and she sees, coming out of this luminous crack in the earth, a stone lingam, yeah? like, a, like an obelisk, like a... Like a phallic shaft of stone rising out of this rent in the earth, the Shiva Lingam. And she sits down in front of it and she starts to contemplate its form and she realizes that the Lingam is not, as many of Shiva's devotees suppose, an embodiment of Shiva, but it's a symbol that works on the principle of negation. And the, symbol, the symbol protrudes so sort of obdurately, so dramatically into space that it sort of emphasizes the negative space around it. Right? And she realizes that Shiva just is that open space in which form appears. And as she's having this realization, she starts to feel that familiar sensation of breath on the back of her neck. And, and then she feels the sensation on the front of her face and she opens her eyes and she was sitting there before her in one of his beautiful forms. And he closes his eyes and she closes her eyes. And she feels him open up. And she simply plunges into him. She feels her consciousness move into his. As if he is the very space in which all of the contents of her mind can unfold and she feels held and adored by that open, infinitely loving, infinitely compassionate consciousness. So in that moment, Shiva and Sati are united and Sati doesn't return home. She goes back with Shiva on the back of his white bull, Nandan, and they go uh, to the top, you know, up to Shiva's mountaintop abode. And 
she becomes his wife. Yeah? She sends a letter home to tell her father where she is. And her father never writes back. And she understands that he's scandalized by their union. Yeah? So, Daksha, as a sort of meticulous ritualist, he represents the ego function of the ordinary mind, your ego function, my ego function. He represents this function of continuously naming things, right, of naming experiences, of wrapping them with concepts in order to make them sensible, tangible, relatable, manageable, right? So that we know whether or not a particular you know, phenomenon is threatening or beneficent or you know, whether we can take advantage of it or whether we can simply leave it alone. Yeah? And, you know, Sati, the goddess, represents, as I said before, she represents the creative effulgence of the feminine principle, right? And that principle is, I mean, the very point of her warning at the beginning of the story is that this principle is ineffable, irreducible to any particular conceptual scheme, right? That any attempt to fully conceptualize the feminine will always come up short, yeah? and that there's always infinitely more to the creative effusion of nature, right, to the creative effusion of the natural world outside of us, but also to the phenomenal world that presents as our own thoughts, feelings, memories, and sensations, right, the contents of our own minds. There's always infinitely more to that than we can never take account of. Okay? But the ego, of course, its role is to form a particular image of who we are by which we can sort of navigate the circumstances of our lives, right? So this role that Daksha represents is totally natural to the ego function. It's not something that the ego could get along without. It's not something that we could get along without, right? It's the very thing that forms our personality, right? It's the very thing that, you know, that takes from among this sort of infinite formless mass of sensation that presents itself to subconscious experience and makes and draws out of it certain strands that make sense, that we can relate to, and then that we can identify with and call ourselves. Yeah? So, um, Shiva represents pure consciousness, which is to say, consciousness that is, is completely open to anything that comes within its field. Right? And so, uh, one inherent dimension of that kind of consciousness is compassion, which is a, a complete absence of judgment, right? But a sort of interested embracing of everything that comes within it, right? And so when Shiva and Shakti are united, and they usually unite, right, the, I mean, in this story, I mean, what does what Shiva and Shakti do together? What are they into? Well, when Shiva and Shakti go back to their mountaintop abode, it's said that they, you know, the first thing they do is consummate their new union. They make love for 25 years without any, without any climactic moment, okay? And this is very important in the symbology of their lovemaking and what it represents, that Shiva never spills his seed in making love with, with any of the incarnations of the goddess, okay? Um, 
because their union, the idea is that their union is perfectly selfless, and so it's totally free of any sort of selfless or egocentric pursuit of pleasure or any egocentric agenda to experience anything in particular like an orgasm. Okay? It's totally free from that. Okay? It's simply a, an exploration of the interpenetration and the, the, sort of, the sort of mutually dependent nature of consciousness and the creative principle that is perfect in every moment. Right? It's not tending toward anything. It's simply perfect in every moment that it's, that it's, that it's complete. Yeah? And that, that idea of consciousness and the creative principle exploring one another in a sort of apotheosis of intimacy, in an intimacy that's completely devoid of any selfish agenda or of any desire to have a particular kind of experience or to see anything or to feel anything in particular, that kind of intimacy okay, is yoga. Okay? It's the union of these two principles that Shiva and Shakti represent. That's the very, the very essence of the contemplative practice is the intimate exploration of these two principles, the way in which embodiment and consciousness can fully meld into one another. Okay? So the practice for us is really represented mostly by, I mean, I told you a couple of days ago how we, you know, we're sort of focusing on this lunar quality of opening, of making space for the experience of the practice, right? Rather than projecting a particular idea of what the practice is supposed to feel like, what it's supposed to look like from outside, how many breaths you're supposed to take, exactly where your hand is supposed to lie, right? All of which helps to ritualize the process and create a container for this kind of experience. But ultimately, we surrender all of that. We try and connect with this more sort of lunar sense of opening so that we can just simply absorb the reflective rays of the sun, the reflective rays of the creative principle. Yeah? So our practice is to sort of try and connect with that, that lunar quality of openness or of compassion that Shiva represents. Okay. And what are we up against? Well, Daksha, the ego, right? Because as soon as this, as soon as those, as soon as you sort of open yourself, right, to seeing what lies outside of the boundaries of the ego, that is to seeing what kinds of sensations you're actually experiencing, what kinds of memories you're holding within yourself, what kinds of impulses are kind of stewing in the depths of your body. When you open yourself to that, the ego is immediately threatened because most of that, it has conveniently sconced away somewhere in your body, <laughs> yeah? or sconced away somewhere in the depths of your subconscious mind, because the ego can't handle all of that. Its very function is to try and make sense out of things, and you can't make sense out of the sublime, right? You can't make sense out of something that is, I mean, so, so the very concept of the sublime, you know, is the concept of something that relates closely to the beautiful. You know, to say that something is sublime is to say, well, it's, it's certainly beautiful, but it's more than that, right? Because what's beautiful might be sort of pleasing to look at, pleasing to taste, pleasing to touch, right? But what's sublime is disorienting and threatening at the same time. Huh? Okay. And it's disorienting and threatening because it sort of well, it threatens, to, it threatens to overwhelm you if it overflows. Okay. It threatens to dissolve the boundaries of the ego by exposing you right, 
to that excessive, super abundant, uncontrollable and unpredictable nature of creativity itself. Okay. So you can, and of course you, you encounter that sublimity in your own mind when you sit to practice. Mm -hmm. And the ego has all kinds of tricks for pulling you out of that immediately, right? Like distraction, right? It suddenly conjures up an idea or image like, you have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> you have an itch on the back of your neck. This is stupid. You have better things to do, you know? So the mind, it immediately tries to distract you away from that experience, you know? And it's extremely good at it, you know, and extremely resourceful. It marshals all of the resources of your imagination in order to pull you out of that experience, right? If it feels threatened by it. Or another thing that the ego likes to do, it wants to, it wants to, it wants to try and control that experience of, of sublimity, right? Because so, It's part of our condition as human beings that we long for these kinds of experiences. You know, we long to be close to that which is infinite, that which is vast, that which is unconditioned. Yeah? But as soon as we have a little glimmering of that, as soon as we have a little taste of the sublime, the mind immediately tries to grab a hold of it because it wants it. it want, and it wants to control that and it wants to know how, to, how can I relate to this and how can I, you know, how can I reconstruct, how can I hold on to this experience so I can consume it and then reconstruct the conditions in which I had this experience so I can do it again whenever I want, right? So the mind immediately tries to name the experience, right? And, you know, of course, tradition, culture, right, is in the business of giving us signs and symbols for all of these experiences, right? And so there's, there's a wealth of symbols for your experiences of, of the infinite, right, which you can immediately grasp a hold of, and then maybe you can situate them within a particular kind of spiritual or religious or yogic tradition, right, to help you make sense of them. But in every case, it's a form of idolatry. It's a form of reducing right, the infinite nature of that experience to something containable, to something discrete, to a symbol. Right? And there's nothing else for the mind to do. There's no other way to talk about the infinite or the absolute except with symbols, right? because that's just part of our finitude. So even our symbols of the absolute are ideas about the absolute, are ideas about the excessive effulgence of the creative principle, right? Are finite, limited ideas that merely signify without ever fully capturing or embodying the thing that they represent. Okay? So, after Sati goes to live with Shiva on the mountain, Daksha devotes himself with great religious fervor to his ritualism, yeah? And he sort of climbs through the ranks of uh, the orthodox establishment, and he becomes the sort of presiding deity of, um, of religious ritual. You know, he becomes the, the most authoritative priest in all of the land. Yeah? Um, and he decides to, to, to sort of plan this, um, to plan the most elaborate ritual that the world has ever seen, a ritual to fullness. And so he, um, he starts to make preparations like a year in advance, you know, 
There are rituals for designing the ritual objects that will play a role in the ritual. There are, he builds, he builds you know, palaces so that he can invite all of the gods and, and, and host them in proper form for the day of his ritual. And um, he starts to send out invitations, you know, inviting everybody who's anybody to his ritual. Um, and so all of the gods are getting invitations, you know, and um, and Sati hears about this, and in her sort of youthful naivete, she's she's blissed because she she imagines that oh her father wants to sort of make reparations, because of course Shiva will have to be Shiva's like the greatest of the gods, so he's going to be invited to this ritual, and she imagines herself showing up with Shiva at her arm and seeing her sisters again and, um, you know, and, and having a sort of a reunion. But as the ritual draws nearer, she doesn't receive any invitation, you know, and she keeps waiting and waiting. And on the day of the ritual, she wakes up and, you know, the full force of what's happening suddenly descends over her. She realizes that she and Shiva have been pointedly excluded from this ritual. Yeah. So she's incensed. She's, she's filled with rage. And she tells Shiva that she's going to her father's house. And Shiva begs her not to go, but and she tells him firmly that she's going, and Shiva doesn't oppose the goddess because the goddess is the source of all power, including his power. This, the goddess, she's the only thing that he's afraid of. I mean, Shiva hangs out with ghosts and goblins and all kinds of marginal beings and sleeps in cremation grounds and wears snakes as jewelry and so forth. So, <laughs> he's a pretty fearless being, but Shakti's wrath is, makes him cower. <laughs> so instead, he says that he'll send an entourage of his ganas, of his sort of attendants, or there's these, you know, his gana, there's these, these like ghoulish marginal beings, right? And they represent, so Shiva is sometimes called Dayalu, or the compassionate one. Right? And he prefers to live out on the margins of society. He prefers to, um, he's, he sort of has a pointed distaste for all things that are, um, that are cultured, that are um, governed by rules and protocols, and that are sort of structured by social norms and so forth. He has a pointed distaste for those things, and he gathers around him all of these like marginal beings that just don't fit comfortably inside of the presiding schemes of organization. Okay. We have a lot of those in Boulder, incidentally. They live down by the creek. And their numbers have increased in recent years because we legalized marijuana <laughs> three years ago, and now they're starting to build housing for them, which is good. But um, so, so Shiva is, the, and these, these beings, they represent what's called Shesha. And Shesha is this lovely Sanskrit word that means like the remainder, what's left over. So it's everything that doesn't fit inside, you know, the presiding scheme of organization or everything that doesn't fit inside your conception of what's happening or your conception of what you are, right? And Shiva prefers to make the company of those beings, right? And the word, it has this sort of, it comes from, it's a very old word, it comes from uh, the context of like Vedic ritual, where, you know, the idea it, that, where it's very important that all of the things that you throw in the sacrificial fire burn cleanly. You want them to burn up and for them to be nothing left, right? But of course, whenever you make a fire or burn at anything, there's always, there's always some some lumps of stuff left there, yeah? And that's called the shesha. And you don't want there to be any shesha. Like, Daksha doesn't want there to be any shesha, right? 
So when no one's looking, you know, and the fire's down, you like take your bare foot and you step on the shesha, even though you burn a hole in your foot and make sure that, so no, before anybody sees it, and then you call it perfect, you know? It's like an asana, you know, and you, like maybe if I, I'll just skip that side and the teacher won't, <laughs> he won't even notice. He'll think I already did it. It's kind of like that. Um, so, so Shiva's the friend of the Shesha, and it's on that account that he's sort of known as the compassionate one. He makes the company of these beings. And that's one way of understanding why Daksha finds him so threatening, right? Because Daksha definitely doesn't want the Shesha, right? He's like, you know, in terms of American politics, he represents the Republican stance, you know? He wants, he said, move the Shesha out of the park, okay? Yes, it's for public use, for people who would pay their taxes, you know? And <laughs> where are the Shesha supposed to go? I don't know, just out of sight. That's where they belong, right? <laughs> So, you know, you move them from bridge to bridge, and then when people complain, you like, usually over the railroad tracks is the old saying. You make a move to the other side of the tracks, and then you have to keep moving the tracks themselves until they're, you know, out on the plains or down in a canyon or something, and then they just get scorched. And at least that's how we deal with them in the States. Um, so, Shiva sends Sati down the mountain with this entourage of ganas, of bhutas and pretas, ghosts and goblins, you know. And she's riding on the back of Nand and the bull, Shiva's vehicle. And they're blowing conchs and waving banners and holding the white parasol of royalty over her head. And Shiva sheds a tear for her as she goes down the mountain because he knows that this is the last time she'll, he will see her in this form. But they go storming down the mountain, 60,000 strong, and there's like quaking the earth as they go down toward the, toward the yagna, toward the ritual hall where Daksha's conducting this, this ceremony. And the guests can feel the ground quaking before they can even see Sati arrive, and everyone's like this sense of tension comes over the hall. Uh, and, you know, by the time they, by the time she finally arrives and comes into the hall, everyone is like fully aware of her presence. And they cast their eyes downward out of respect for the goddess and also partly out of fear. And so Daksha's there and he's, you know, he's been do he's been chanting for hours and he's just a brilliant, ritualist and so he's, ch he's been chanting with perfect intonation for hours he hasn't missed a single syllable and, you know if you interrupt any of these rituals they're finished you know like, you have to do it perfectly right or else the thing just doesn't come off it doesn't work and so daksha would never break off in the middle of a chant but sati comes walking right through the sacrificial hall and she walks right up to him and he glances up and sees his fa her face and he just stops his heart is like convulsing at the image of this daughter that he loved more than anything in the world and that he feels has been taken from him by this you know, dreadful marginal loser <laughs> so <clears throat> Sati points to this, you know, the gods are like lined up there, They're, they all have a place and there's a, a seat right in the middle. That was like obviously for Shiva, but it's left empty on purpose to sort of show that he's excluded from the ritual. And she points at the seat and she says, you call this a ritual to fullness? You know, how dare you have a ritual to fullness without inviting Shiva, who is fullness itself? And Daksha says, fullness itself, Shiva, who smears his body with cremation ashes, who consorts with ghosts and goblins, who smokes ganja all day, said, Shiva's not fullness. Shiva's breath is a noxious fume that's intoxicated you into delusion. He will never be welcome in this house. 
And so at that moment, sati understands that this ritual isn't a ritual to fullness at all. I mean, she understood before, but she's like fully articulating this thought to herself that this ritual is about a particular image of fullness that's meant to mediate the relationship to fullness. And so that's meant to sort of try and control that longing that we all have to lose ourselves in one another, to lose ourselves in the sublimity of the other, right? To lose ourselves in the sort of infinite flow of creation that every being represents. And this, of course, is the very kind of thing that she warned against before she agreed to incarnate. Yeah? This is the failure to recognize the sublimity of the creative principle being ritualized in the name of fullness. Right? So without a moment of hesitation and without taking her eyes off of her father's eyes, she simply walks backwards slowly to the sacrificial pyre, which is really glowing quite massive now, towering overhead. And she leans back into it and just allows herself to be consumed in the flames and just burn, burns herself up. And so in that act, that act of sati sort of throwing herself into the flame, she, in a certain ironic sense, she consummates the ritual. She brings it to its logical conclusion, right? The ritual wasn't a ritual to connect people to fullness, right? The ritual was the sacrifice of fullness in the name of a particular idea. The ritual was the sacrifice of the feminine principle, the sacrifice of what is excessive and abundant and irreducible and sublime. Okay. Daksha didn't fully comprehend the meaning of the ritual, but by throwing herself in the fire, she articulates that meaning. Yeah? She brings it to its logical conclusion. And Shiva, of course, is, is distraught. Yeah. He immediately feels the loss of sati. He feels her retreat. He feels the effect that is what the mind does whenever we have a taste of fullness, right? You have an experience in yoga, and then as soon as you form that thought like, oh, I'm, I have something, like, something interesting is happening here. Is this samadhi? Is this, you know, you put some kind of name to it, right? And, as soon, and then it's done for. You know, as soon as you call it, as soon as you give it a name, it's over. Because now you've wrapped it in a concept, you've put certain parameters around it, and your, ex your experience is no longer, it's no longer that sort of complete openness of Shiva to the unfolding of the creative principle, but now it's just another conceptualized experience. Even ha it may be still lovely. Your skin may be still crawling a little bit, right? But it's already starting to fade, right? It's already just, it's fading into a memory that now you're holding on to. And so you're distracted away from the present moment now by that idea, by that image, and by that memory, right? And that's the very movement of the mind that this represents. The idea is that whenever we try to grasp at the sublime character of the feminine principle, it retreats. Right? It does just what the goddess said it would do. She draws away whenever we try to grasp at her. You know? so it's like this idea of Mulabandha that we talked about yesterday. As soon as you try to like get, as soon as the ego is too much involved and it becomes too much about like like a Kegel exercise, you know, like, now I'm just like, you're just contracting the pelvic floor, and it's just kind of weird. <laughs> you know? The sublimity of the experience is totally lost on you, 
right? It's still there, of course, because every experience is just the tip of an infinite vast, you know, like an iceberg that opens out into a vast bottomless ocean, right? But as soon as you grasp a hold of it, as soon as you grasp a hold of the goddess, as if you want to possess her, she retreats. And then the moment of intimacy is lost. Yeah? So in a sense, what this yoga is teaching us, which is, and it's so brilliantly symbolized by the love affair between Shiva and Shakti, I mean, that idea that yoga is a sensual union is the idea that to feel the full creative principle, we have to open consciousness to every sensory mode, right? To feel the fullness of Shakti, we have to open our eyes, we have to open our ears, we have to taste and smell and feel the fullness of our experience, right? To intuit it, to have immediate proprioceptive awareness of it, right? And that the condition of true intimacy is one in which there's no objectifying function of the mind. The mind is not objectifying the experience. It's not making an idol out of it. Yeah. It's not grasping at it. Just as Shiva doesn't grasp at a particular climactic experience, right? And just as their, their lovemaking never ends in that kind of climactic moment, right? Intimacy is a sort of perfect, continuous openness to the irreducible otherness of the other. Right? And so the Hatha Yoga is trying to teach us the conditions of true intimacy. Right? So we try to cultivate these conditions first in the context of solitary practice, perhaps. Right? And so you can imagine, well, in the context of asana, simply opening yourself to the experience. Right? allowing yourself to feel the breath moving in a continuous line up and down the center of the body from the pelvic floor all the way to the crown and everything in between, which is a vast, arduous, dangerous journey. <laughs> because from the pelvic floor to the heart, I mean, in, along this line, is, you know, we're holding, this line represents for us as Hatha yogis the, the sort of full spectrum of consciousness Right? from the sort of lowest, most subconscious places that are the source of our instincts for survival, our instincts to sort of, for sustenance, to feed ourselves and to be warm, right? our impulses for you know, sexual intimacy, our impulses for our, our, our sort of basic will and desire to get the things that we want, to make a difference in the world, right? To have the kind, a kind of power in the world that we can sort of see and interact with, right? To relate to other beings on the level of the heart, right? To love and to be loved, to have a voice, to be able to articulate truth, right? and to be able to sort of comprehend and make sense of things, and also to intuit things that might sort of lie just beyond the bounds of sense, right? So all of those ways of relating to the world and all of the various sort of psychical knots that we get into in forming our relationships with those things, they lie along the central axis of the body. And so when we're trying to draw the breath in these long fluid lines, doing our Surya Namaskar, our salutations to that solar principle that Shakti represents, you know, we're from the very beginning, from Samastitihi, from the moment we start to reach our arms up, we're inviting this very sort of threatening experience of the sublime, effulgent, overabundant, excessive nature of the feminine creative principle to, to overflow, to overwhelm 
our sort of limited, isolating ideas about who we are. Yeah? So learning to open ourselves to that, learning to open ourselves to all of the things within us that, that we're anxious to suppress, right? all of the things within us that we'd prefer to keep hidden down below the surface because they sort of don't cohere with our idea about who we are, what we think, what we remember, what we feel, what we're inclined to do, what we like and dislike, right? They threaten all of that, and so we try to keep them below the surface. But this possibility of intimacy is the possibility of opening ourselves to the sort of threatening otherness of all of that within ourselves. Yeah. And if we can open ourselves to otherness within ourselves, then of course we can perhaps maybe stand a dim chance of doing that with the otherness of the beings around us. Yeah. And then hopefully enjoy what we long for most deeply, which is, you know, intimacy with the other. I think that's the best I can do right now. <laughs> well, thank you. Let's finish with a single om. Um. And draw the breath in.